Good morning. Good morning. I have to explain my attire because more than 40 years ago, um, I came back to Cresswell Presbyterian Church after a, well, about a five-year um, visit up north to go to Oregon State and get my degree. I, I finished it up with a degree from U of O too, so that's good. I do, I do have a t-shirt from Gonzaga, so I, I've got all three of them covered. But um, when I came back, something had changed in our church. And that something was something that gave me great joy because it was on picnic Sunday. We didn't have to wear dress-up clothes. And back then, more than 40 years ago, we did wear dress-up clothes every day or every Sunday. So it was really an exciting time to be able to come to church in our picnic clothes. And this happens to be the attire I wore during vacation Bible school, so I thought it was appropriate for today. And I don't know if you know, I don't know what condition your brain came into church today, but I am going to tell you right now where it should be, and hopefully you'll get there. You should be in such thanks to God, because there are a ton of us in this church that had no electricity earlier this, well, yesterday. <laughs> and it was scheduled to be off until later today. We all got it back last night, so we did shower this morning. So, <laughs> so, so you can be thankful. Okay, announcements, announcements. I need to find my announcements. Sorry. Here we go. All right, so today, picnic day, chicken in the park. No, it's here. Um, but we do have the picnic after church. Even if you didn't bring anything, please come. There's lots of food, lots of food. And we made sure that there's gluten-free. We made sure there's vegetarian. We made sure that there's those carnivores within us that were covered too. So, And I did hear there was even jello. Okay, Monday, we have a uh, Bible study is back on. We had a week off last week, but we're back on. Uh, if you're interested, this is an amazing study. Um, we're all enjoying the camaraderie that we have when we are reading these uh, excerpts from very, very thoughtful people who have written to help us in our journey of becoming closer to God. So if you're interested in it, let me know. I can connect you either Zoom or I can tell you where we meet in the ALC. Uh, at 2.30 on Monday, we have the Martha Circle meeting back here at the church library. Is that correct, Marilyn? Yeah, okay, cool. And Wednesday, we have a deacon's meeting at 2 o'clock, and we have um, choir practice at 6.30. I just had thought of something. Okay, so there's that. Then on the 19th, uh, committee meetings, uh, faith fellowship, communication and stewardship. And on the 25th, uh, we have session at noon in the, in the classroom. God's grace. What a marvelous thing to experience in our crazy, smoky lives. We are filled with his love. All we have to do is open our hearts and receive it. He is there seeking us, looking for us to come to him. And as we look in our scriptures, I hope you will do that. Will you join me in prayer? Oh God, thousands of years, you have been designing today. You have made today for us. You have made today for a reunion with you that we can experience in our hearts, in our souls, in our minds, and change our hearts. Oh God, as we look into the scriptures that you have provided for us to learn about you so that we can come closer to you, we ask that you guide us 
Hold our minds fast to your truth. Write your law on our hearts, O God. Amen. Today um, I'll be reading Psalm 14 to begin with, and then we'll go into our New uh, Testament reading. Psalm 14. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable things. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on humankind to see if there are any who are wise, who seek after God. They have all gone astray. They are all alike perverse. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, all the evil evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they shall be in great terror, for God is with the company of the righteous, who would confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion, when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Jacob will rejoice, and Israel will be glad. Our New Testament reading, Luke 15, 1 through 10. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and even eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Kathleen, I welcome you to our pulpit. Of any day that I would like to be able to stand up and do things, today's not the day. My legs have said, "Mm -mm." but we will, we will get through this. As soon as I figure out what we're doing. Okay, got it. This morning, we are looking at a psalm and a passage from the New Testament. They may not seem to go together, but I believe that they do. Psalm 14 can seem rather dour and harsh. Where is the good news? The passage from the New Testament may be so familiar that we will find ourselves lost in what we've always thought about this passage. Indeed, the passage from Luke, on the other hand, is familiar the good shepherd who looks for the lost sheep, leaving 99 by themselves while he looks for the one who is lost, and the story of the widow who loses her small coins, probably all she had for a few days. When we hear or read passages very familiar to us, we may believe that we know all about them, and we may close ourselves off from looking at them in a different way. I imagine most of us have heard these stories. I know I learned about the missing sheep and so on when I was in 
Vacation Bible School. Maybe some of you had that experience. When we, uh, I imagine that most of us have heard these stories, but both are responses to criticism from the religious insiders of the time, the ones who daily practiced their faith, perhaps with great pomp and circumstance and noise. Jesus didn't just spend time with them, those who thought they had it all figured out, but he also spent time with the lesser known, those who thought they had it all figured out. But he also, and the lesser down, the downtrodden, and those without much. These parables were told to the religious insiders, and they were told in order to bring repentance of pious religious thought on the part of the leaders and church members, the insiders of the time, who believed that they had the right track on who was in and who was out. In reading the material for this week, week, I read that there are four themes to be found in the telling of these parables. I believe that Jesus told them to the religious authorities so that they could see more than one way of practicing their piety. The first is the theme of those coming near. We hear about that in verses 1 and 2. The tax collectors and sinners were coming closer to Jesus to hear what he had to say. This action of all coming closer to Jesus was not tolerated by the religious insiders who were feeling displaced from their places as the ones who knew all about their faith and what should be done in worship. They should be the ones to come to the table, not these ragged people who were just now coming to hear Jesus. Who do they think they are? They shouldn't be allowed to be with Jesus. They were too unclean and not ready to receive communion and or listen to a sermon. Sometimes people are still blocked from coming to the table to receive communion or to partake of the meal as it is passed down the pews. Sometimes their ability to receive the wafer and the cup is denied by their position on certain religious matters or by their behavior. Some people think that their beliefs make them unacceptable to receive communion. In one church, some people decided to wear rainbow sashes to church to show their solidarity with people in the LGBTQ community who were barred from taking communion. These rainbow sash members of the church were refused communion that day because of the stand they took. When one of the church members tried to share his wafer with someone who had been refused, the church officials and those who were insiders called the police. Do we replace God with our religious authorities, or do we welcome all who come to worship God? The second theme at the core of each of these parables is that of welcoming and saving. The two parables this morning speak about about the search for something, a lost sheep and a lost coin. Now, I haven't lost any sheep but I have lost coins, and I know what that's like. Both of these items have an impact on those who lost them, and these things are important to them. Hearing these stories might be comforting to someone who has lost his or her way and is anxious to find a church home, a place to belong. One of the questions I ran across in my reading is, is it a search to save or a search to welcome. God has a long, loving reach, able to use it to gather the lost in. Sometimes the insiders might be more comfortable with saving the lost rather than welcoming those they perceive to be lost. Somewhere I read that saving is about power and welcoming is about intimacy. Saving is also focused on the individual, whereas welcoming is focused on the community and making new people feel welcome. 
We all need to be welcomed. The third theme here is the diligent search and joyful find. Often when we hear or, or are looking for something, it requires diligence, going the extra mile, going into dark places, searching and looking harder. Sometimes we lose something important to us and it becomes difficult to let go of the hurt and the loss we feel. It stays on our minds and we are unable to be totally there for what is happening around us. While I was reading the material for this sermon, I discovered that I didn't know where my car keys were. Not a big thing, and I was supposed to be working on a sermon, but I had somewhere I wanted to go. Have you ever lost something and couldn't think of anything else? I finally asked my husband if he'd seen them, and he showed me where they were, somewhere where I put something on top of them. Not unusual for me. Sometimes we need the helping hand of a friend or of God to help us recall important and not so important things to mind. The story of the woman who lost her coins belongs in this section upon diligent search and joyful find. She had a few silver coins, possibly needed to get something to eat, and she couldn't find them. She may have lived in a small place without a lot of light and the dirt floors. The coins were hard to find, but she didn't give up on looking. <coughs> She swept and looked until she recovered her money. The diligent search can be the hard work of sweeping clean and sweeping out old notions of humanity, worthiness, and righteousness. It often takes a paradigm shift. Who's welcome and who's not? It may be that someone comes to church in ragged clothes and is looking down upon them. Is it the clothes or the people that we're welcoming? Deciding how to help someone can be difficult. Do they feel judged if we offer them something? Or our attitude about helping needs to be joyful, not grudging. We should also do our best to find out whether the person wants our help, and if so, in what way. Do we make them or buy them new clothes or offer them a gift certificate to a store? What if they don't use it right? Not our business if we offer it to them. Will we judge how they use it? Is the person happy to be allowed to choose the gifts him or herself? Jesus not only emphasizes joy, he also expects rejoicing on our part. Someone was lost and now is found. The person we help may feel like rejoicing too, but even if he or she doesn't show any outward signs of rejoicing, we know that we helped someone else. The fourth theme in this parable is who is the sinner? The final turn of phrase at the end of the parables provides a final twist. We may believe that the sinners are the ones who need repentance, who need their minds changed. But that's not what the passage says. It reads, God rejoices when the religious insiders in all of us change their minds about who is in and who is out. A complete community is a cause for rejoicing a community where all are included and none are lost. How do we make someone feel welcome? In the church where I grew up, there was a woman with several children who came to church regularly, a woman who needed help. Some of the women in the church gathered together to see what we could do, making clothes for the children, getting something for her, making a friend, after a while, things seemed harder for her, and she mentioned, I guess it's time to have another baby. The woman, woman was not married, and her comment challenged us in the church. She would get more money from the state. 
if she had another child. She was still accepted in the church, but she did eventually move on. What could we have done differently? Jesus tells two different parables, and the gender of the main character is different in each, a woman and a man. No one is left out. There may still be some truth hidden, meant to be discovered in a thorough search or in a thorough sweeping clean. These parables are guides to us. We are to search for the lost and welcome all, even perhaps giving up the seat where we always sit. That doesn't happen here, that's it. <laughs> when I go to church sometimes in a different place, I'm not sure where to sit. Sometimes it may hurt a little to be welcoming. As we leave this morning, may we continue to ponder who is in and who is out. Is there someone who has not been welcomed? How do we let people know that we are a loving church based on the life and ministry of Jesus Christ? And where that is, there is joy and surprise. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, when our spirits lift at the end of the day, you are Lord. And when chaos threatens to overwhelm and we dread the next news cycle, still you are Lord. Always you are, re are creating, redeeming, sustaining. Speak then your mercy into this space until we discover the courage to open our eyes, unclench our hands, and move toward our neighbor in need until all the world arises and moves with the rhythm of your grace. For we long to honor the name of Jesus, by whose breath we pray. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.